All right, you should have, uh, you can have the handout sheet I gave you. You can have your book open. So let's go over this. Uh, let's do the physics of this. If, if everything above absolute zero has kinetic energy, we need to look at the kinetic energy equation. And it's kinetic energy is one half mv squared, uh, mass times velocity squared. And I asked this the other day, what is the relationship between mass and kinetic energy? Of course, that assumes that velocity is held constant. So let me ask you a question. A particle has <clears throat> a mass of, of one kilogram. Another particle has a mass of two kilograms. They're going at the same speed. Which one will, if it hits a piece of metal, will make a bigger dent? Which one's going to uh, deliver more kinetic energy? <clears throat> and if what is the relationship between mass and kinetic energy? Um, MSA, what do you think? What proportionality is there between mass and kinetic energy? Everything else is held, everything else is constant. What kind of proportionality is that? Direct. Which one? Which direct? Direct proportionality, direct square proportionality, direct square root proportionality. Hey, can you stop talking? Hey, talking. So. What is it? Okay, now I'll give you a clue. Mass is not being squared, so what do you think? It is. So what that means is if you have twice the mass, you have twice the kinetic energy. Everybody got that? Um, cars, for example, cars have different masses. If they're both going at 60 miles an hour uh, and they hit something, police... I'm not saying the police officer himself knows the physics, but if they record the exact distance the car went and things like that, they can actually put that in a computer and they can say things. They were going at about 80 miles per hour when they went around that corner. They use physics to actually tell that. <clears throat> Nobody saw them. <clears throat> Nobody saw them. <clears throat> All right, so what about this? What's the relationship between velocity and kinetic energy? And that means mass is held constant. <clears throat> and let me see if, uh, who, let's see, who could do this? Uh, Liam, what's the, what's, the relate, what's the proportionality between uh, velocity and kinetic energy? Um, the higher velocity, the higher the, oh, sorry, the, uh, you're getting close. Uh, That's right. So if you have a one kilogram object going at uh, 20 meters per second, and a one kilogram object going at 20, I mean, what did I say, 20 and 40, if it's going twice as fast, how much kinetic energy does it have? If you, if you make the mass get, if you get the velocity get two times bigger, the kinetic energy gets times. two squared times bigger, four. And, and that's when they talk about these asteroids. And, and they're scary things because these asteroids, um, they don't have to be that big because they're, they're going at a certain speed, and then when they get close to the Earth, they'll actually start picking up speed, and they'll pick up speed, and they'll pick up speed. And so uh, an asteroid maybe the size of uh, this building could deliver a huge, huge amount of kinetic energy to Earth. And if it hits the ocean, uh, a big, big wave, a huge wave would set up, like a tsunami. Tsunamis are usually from earthquakes, but a huge wave would be set up if it hits the ground, it would make a big hole in the ground and lots and lots of material will be thrown up in the air and it probably maybe even spread out over the, the whole planet. Yes? So, you know how you said um, when you jump, you're technically like moving the Earth too? Well, I think what I said was if you jump, do um, uh, you mean it, the Earth is going to attract you to the Earth, uh, the Earth's going to attract you here and you're going to attract the Earth to yourself. Yeah. Um, now, it is also true, though, when I push the earth down, it pushes me up. Yeah. So go ahead. So um, it just got me thinking, like, if a huge asteroid or, like, space debris or something, like, a huge one comes into the earth, would it, like, significantly? Well, first of all, if it's as big as the moon, uh, no one's going to survive that. Nobody on the planet is going to survive that. So at this point... We don't know of any asteroids or uh, space stuff that's as big as the moon. But even something significantly smaller uh, can have a huge impact. 
Um, so I, I wouldn't, it would have to be, even if, even if it's as big as the moon, it, it, they would attract each other. You're right. It would pull the earth a little bit uh, toward the moon, the moon toward the earth, and they both would move in their orbits. Uh, so even if we survived it, we would be in a different orbit. If we're a little bit further away from the earth, everything would be really, really cold. It would probably be a constant winter. If it, if it moved us closer, it might be so warm that a lot of the water you know, change the clouds, and uh, that that would, you know, God put us right in the right place. That's a good question, though. Um, I like the theoretical, I like the hypothetical question you had, but um, if it's something as large as the moon, we, we, we can answer it, but we'd be dead. <clears throat> so, all right, so let's go another one. Um, what is the relationship between mass and velocity? Now, this is one that's even the most difficult question I've asked. Um, let's see if uh, Ben, will you try? It? Why don't you try? It? What's the relationship between mass and velocity? You're on the same side of the equal sign. It would be is there a square above velocity? Uh huh. Okay, so it'd be inverse squared. Yes, excellent. That's excellent. Now, what does that mean? So, what if what if somebody had a mass that was two times bigger than something else? If this if this had to be held constant, if they had the same kinetic energy, and a particle had a mass that was twice two times bigger than that particle, what about its speed? If the mass was two times bigger, the yes, the speed would only be one fourth as much. So if you had something that was a smaller, uh, a bigger mass, and it was moving only one fourth of the speed, it would have the same kinetic energy as something that had half the mass moving at, at, at a certain speed. And that's what I was trying to tell you that if you had a balloon, if you had two balloons and they were at room temperature, uh, one thing that helped me a great deal, and I didn't even hear about this until college, was that the word temperature is the same as saying the average kinetic energy of the particles. And so when you see my hands go like this, here's a 10 degree water, here's 20 degree water, here's 50 degree water, you see that? It's really, really, they're moving a lot faster, isn't it? So when you have the same temperature, you have the same average kinetic energy. So look right here. If this is the same for oxygen, a balloon full of oxygen, a balloon full of helium, which one has particles moving faster? They have the same temperature. So they have the same average kinetic energy. What do you think, Jessica? Which one are gonna have the particles moving faster or are they moving at the same speed? Say it again. They're moving at the same speed. What do you think? She said same speed. Okay, let's take a look. If they're at the same temperature, they do have the same what? Kinetic energy. But this mass is eight times greater than that. If this is held constant, because they have the same temperature, you said, and the mass is eight times greater, then the speed of those particles has to be 64 times smaller. So if you could see these pieces at room temperature, these guys would be moving at 64 times the speed of the other ones. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but um, if you do stay into science, uh, there's, they do this sometimes in chemistry, where they take different size particles at, at, the, at room temperature, and they open up a tube and let these particles of gas move and they try to figure out how fast they're going. If I were to take some perfume, a bottle of perfume, and I poured it into a Petri dish, so it's really a lot of surface area, um, and I say, raise your hand when you smell it. Uh, you, you would raise your hand first, and then you would, and then you would, and maybe, maybe you would later. And so what's happening is that, that's called diffusion. Remember in biology class, diffusion? And the particles themselves are moving and eventually they're gonna spread out from areas of higher concentration to areas of lower and they're gonna spread out. <clears throat> now, if the one perfume has a molecule that's much smaller, it'll actually diffuse faster than a molecule of perfume has a big big molecule like that. I, uh, I might turn, well, I guess I'm all right with this. I, I was gonna turn the video off. But <clears throat> sometimes, sometimes, let's say for example, you're working on a ladder, and somebody's working with you. And not that you want to, 
But what if you have <clears throat> a little bit of, uh, you feel like you just have gas. Okay, so you gotta think about this. <clears throat> if, if somehow some gas comes out and you're on a ladder, here, here it's kind of weird that I'm thinking like this, okay? I know that that gas can diffuse at a certain rate. So I'm wondering if the person's gonna smell it. So, what are you talking about? So here's my thinking. <clears throat> a certain amount of, of, of those molecules are gonna diffuse out like this and they'll go in every direction, right? But I also know that it's warmer, that the air coming out of my body is warmer. <laughs> so what's the warm air gonna do with all the gas? So, so I was thinking about if the air rises fast enough, yeah. then, then maybe, you know. Hey, let's get off that topic. Um, at, least, at least I made you think about a little bit about diffusion like that. So let's take a look um, and let's go over here and let's talk about these right here. Here's a teacup full of boiling water, and here's our great big bucket of 80 degree water Celsius water, right? Which one has the higher average kinetic energy? Uh, the smaller teacup. Or are they the same? So I need everybody's attention, okay? So we can do this. Which one has the higher uh, average kinetic energy of particles? If you could go visit them, the particles on average. Would, which one? All right, how many people think it's this one? Yeah. How many people think it's this one? Yeah. How many people think it's saying the same? Everybody well, temperature the is average kinetic energy. So if you have a higher temperature, your particles are moving on the average faster than these particles. Which one of these have more heat in them? Oh. And heat is not average kinetic energy, it's total kinetic energy. And there's so many, there's so many particles here that the total amount of kinetic energy here is, is uh, total, that's heat, is way more than this. One of the questions in your book might say something like this. Which has more, which has a higher temperature, a thimble full of boiling water or an iceberg, which is as big as this building? Which one has a higher temperature? Okay, the thimble, because the water in there is about 100 degrees Celsius. Which one has, which one has particles with the higher average kinetic energy? Because I just repeated my question, temperature is average kinetic energy. Which one has more thermal energy? The iceberg. Remember, an iceberg may feel cold to you, but an iceberg is way above absolute zero, isn't it? An iceberg has a huge amount of kinetic energy, huge. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> um, one more thing, and uh, then I'll get to some new things. Uh, I told you a story about my grandson. I was really proud, even the first grader, he had known, I asked him some question about something, and we are just, we saw something happen. He says, I said, why do you think that happens? He says, because heat rises. And I was really proud that as a first grader, he had actually taught or taught himself or heard it in school that heat rises. Now, for you, I had to teach you, uh, I'm not gonna say this to my grandson, but uh, that's not true. Uh, heat is where can, uh, thermal energy moves from one place to another, okay? <clears throat> so here's what happens. If you have particles that are hotter, if they have a higher temperature and they're going around faster, okay? and they have something next to it and they're not moving as fast. What happens when something hotter comes in contact with something that's slower? What do you think would happen? The right, the faster particles will run into them, make them go faster, but these will make them go slower. And so heat doesn't rise. Heat always goes from a hotter temperature to a lower. Even if it's like this, what if the ice cube is uh, down here and the hot uh, piece of metal's here. You put the metal here, which way does the heat travel? Hot metal, ice cube. Parker, what do you think? Uh, I think ice, uh, ice cube. Come on, don't waste time, okay? <laughs> hot piece of metal, <laughs> hot piece of metal, <laughs> block of ice. Hot piece of metal, <laughs> block of ice. Which way the heat's gonna go? Uh, it's gonna go to the block of ice. It is. But I thought you said heat rises. No, it just goes to the place where it's needed. Needed? 
Needed? Do they? Yeah. Like a one ad? Like a one ad? Need, needed? So, so anyway, you know why? Why do we actually say? Why do we say the heat rises? Because when air, when air gets hot, hang on. When air gets hot, it expands, and it becomes less dense, doesn't it? And what does less dense air do? It rises and takes the heat with it. That's why that, that when you get on a ladder, uh, it's much hotter near the ceiling than it is on the floor. See that? Because the hot air is less dense and it takes the heat with it. But heat always travels from a higher temperature to a lower temperature. Okay, um, teacup of boiling water, iceberg the size of the school. You pour the hot water on there, uh, which way is the heat gonna go? Uh, let me ask you some questions. Teacup water or iceberg? Which one has the higher temperature? Teacup. Which one has the greater amount of thermal energy? Ice cube. The iceberg. <laughs> iceberg. Okay, so, so wait a minute. The iceberg has more thermal energy, so will heat go from the iceberg into the hot water or hot water into the iceberg? Okay, so, so don't get fooled there. Heat does not travel from areas that have the most thermal energy to have the less. It always travels from things that are hotter into areas that are cooler. Or it's the same, same concept as pressure. What now? Same concept as pressure. It goes from the, it always wants to go from the oh, yeah. pressure to low pressure. Yeah, to try to eat, huh? And, and so in a way, if you think about the kinetic energy and particles hitting each other, uh, they would have to do that. All right, so let's go over here. The, uh, demonstration? No. <laughs> oh, gosh, Tucker, your finger. Tucker, what's Tucker? Tucker, man. Tucker, I'll say, I did make it a little cooler last period for yeah. that person. Uh, or, or they were a little bit tougher than I don't know. Oh! Oh! oh. Wow. That finger was tough. Uh, no, Tucker, 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 he's a tough guy. He's a tough guy. No, they're yeah, a tough guy. All right, here we go. Uh, let me show you uh, the next thing we're show you on the demonstration. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, I already did this one again. If, if you are uh, patient and you'd like to try something like this, you could do that. We could hook up a, a, situ a situation like this. Um, you would just have like a little data table and it says copper, aluminum, brass, steel. And what you do is uh, if you want to do them one at a time, you could, or two at a time. How long did it take before the liquid crystal showed up, uh, the heat going here, block number one, block number two, and you make a graph, and your graph has four lines on it. Uh, one's a heating uh, curve, might be a straight line, of copper, aluminum, brass, steel. Then what you do is you do another experiment where you heat them all up, so all the colors show, and then you take it out and figure out how long it took before you missed the block, missed the block, and they turn black. And that, those are neat. I've had, every year I've had somebody do that they, uh, they do a good job on it. All right, let's go over here now. Uh, here's something that... Um, this, uh, yeah, this person did not make a lot of money, but I, it's really neat to, to see this. Somehow, the company was able to, uh, and they use this in other industries, but there are two different kinds of metal here. You learned on this that metals can conduct heat differently. Some metals are faster at conducting heat. And usually the ones that conduct heat faster always also lose heat faster. All right, so this right here, imagine two different kinds of metal and they're fused together. They can't get away from each other. They can't get away from each other, but one of them, another thing that happens when you heat things is that as the particles move faster and try to get away from their neighbor a little bit more, their volume increases. So what happens to almost every item when you heat it, what happens to its volume? It gets bigger, but the mass stays the same. So what happens to its density? If things are heated, they usually become what, more dense or less dense? Less dense. Less dense. That's why hot air rises. So what happens here is when another thing happens besides density changing, um, things like every item actually uh, grows. It grows a little bit, its volume gets bigger, so the length will get bigger. One of these pieces of metal will lengthen faster than another, but they can't get away from each other, so what happens? It explodes. They could, it 
could explode, but I think something else can happen. Oh. oh. Now, what happened is, let me add, now, this is where you had to think. Metal on top or metal on the bottom, which one expands at a faster rate? The one on the top. Very, very good. Now, they can't get away from each other, so if this one expands faster than this one, it's going to curl this way. And you might say, oh, I'll turn it upside down. I'll bet it'll, curl this. I'll bet it'll still curl down. Uh, that's not true. See that? They might say, well, I don't understand why somebody would even make one of these. Uh, there's no purpose except for a physics teacher to do an experiment. But I want to show you what they did with it. They took the bimetallic strip and they turned it into a coil. They put it into a coil. And this right here, let's try and find the lid for this one. Unfortunately, They've used these for about 100 years, but I guess fortunately, almost every one of you have had these replaced in your house. Uh, now, if you have a mountain house or a beach house, chances are you may not have thought it was worth the cost. Does anybody still have one of these in their house? One of my campers. Good, all right. This has been for about 100 years, it's called a thermostat. It's how you keep the uh, heat at the same level or the coolness at the same level. And here's how it works. Take this little lid off, okay? And if you go home and your parents, what are you doing? Um, and here's how it works. You put in the points right here is that bimetallic strip. And the bimetallic strip is in a coil. So what happens is that when it gets too hot, then the coil will get longer or it'll get smaller. So in this case, because it's in a coil, it'll make the coil go this way or it'll make it go this way. You say, well, I don't understand. How's that supposed to help my house? Well, here's what the ingenious device they've used for about 100 years. It's called a mercury switch. Now, mercury is a real metal. At room temperature, it's a, room, it's a liquid. And let me show you what's going on. I'm going to tilt it this way. Now, when the mercury is down here, these two wires, they're fused into that little capsule, but they're not touching each other. So you don't have a complete circuit, and the furnace says, off, off. You don't have a complete circuit. When the bimetallic strip down here, uh, it gets, if it gets kind of um, cold, if it gets cold, it'll start uncurling like this, and it'll go, it'll make this little guy go down here. Gravity will make the mercury switch go here. Mercury is a metal, it conducts electricity, and the two wires are now connected, and now you have a complete circuit, the furnace goes on. If it gets too hot, the bimetallic strip says go like this, mercury goes like that, the furnace goes off. It's really ingenious. For about 100 years, that's how they did it. I'm gonna pass that around so you can look at it. Um, again, I, I know why people want the electronic thermostats because you can program them. I come on at four o'clock before I get home from work. You know, I understand that. And so you, you're, gonna, you're not gonna see these very often anymore uh, because people like the idea of programming. They're even gonna be from their phone. Hey, turn the furnace on, turn the furnace off. So it's gonna, in your lifetime, you probably won't see this. I'll show you another one here. Um, here's one. This one's kind of neat because it has um, not one lever. By the way, the lever sets the angle of the mercury switch. So if you said, hey, I don't want that furnace to come on until it gets to be 80, um, I want it to be 80 degrees before it comes on. That means it'll never come on, almost. You can do that. But what this one is, um, if you have even your uh, electronic one has a thing like this. There's a switch that says cool, another says heat. So what that means is this has two thermostats in it, and you'll see two different bimetallic strips, two different mercury switches, and one of them controls the air conditioning, and one of them controls the uh, heat. That was pretty, that was, at one time that was, wow, you got two thermostats. So let me pass this around too. Let's set that over on that side. You know, okay, wait, I'll get those. As you can see, uh, I have a lot of these because uh, people they, they switch them out and they don't do it anymore. All right, one more. Let's do one more. So while you're looking at Expand everything actually expands. Everything expands when you heat it. 
Uh, we'll talk about an exception. There's a small exception for water, but only between zero and four degrees. We'll talk about that exception tomorrow. Take a look at this. Uh, here is a uh, brass ring and a brass ball, and the way they made it is it whoa. Okay, it fits. Okay, so right now the hole is plenty big. The question is, what would happen if I took it through there and I started heating the ball? Oh. Would, it, would it still be able to come back through? Yeah. So let's say, let's say for right now you said, well, I'll bet the ball will get a little bigger, it won't be able to fit, and you won't be able to get it back through. But then the next question I ask for you is this. What if I heat up the ring? Now, this is a hard wait This is much harder than you think. If the ring gets bigger, will the hole in there get bigger? Or will the hole get smaller? It's smaller at all. Alright, so which way, which way do you want me to do it? Tell me which way you want to do it. Do you want me to um, can we heat the ring and see if it's easier to put the the ball through it? Or I think you want this one first. You want to do this one? Yeah. And by the way, this isn't going to look hot, but I promise you that this ball is incredibly, it's going to be incredibly hot. Let's go through the green ball. Versus me. I'm going to wait to this. <laughs> No, but that'll just make it smaller. So of course it'll He's trying to get it out. Well, no, but I'm trying to get it out. Yeah, trying, trying to get it out. out. Trying to get it out. Oh, no. Okay, there you go. Now, the question is, if I heat the ring, will it close up? This part will get bigger, and this part will get bigger. What do you think? So, you know how, look how easy it is. See, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of easy to, hey man. Whoa. Again. Okay, it does pass through here barely. and barely. Let's take a look. <laughs> Take a little while to heat this ring up. It's just yeah. ring. The cloud set on itself. That's the hard thing to work. Alright, ready? If it's a lot easier to go through, then I know the hole actually got bigger. If it's, uh, if I can't get through there, I know the hole closes up. All right, ready? Here we go. Oh. So the ring does get bigger on the outside, but also the hole gets bigger also. And so that's a lot of people, that was, that's a little tricky. Well, that's why donuts are so cool. Nah, dude. Because donuts expand. No. <laughs> All right, I'll try one more thing, and I'm going to show you how this works. Uh, uh, okay, now, I have to be careful, uh, because I'm going to try to heat the bimetallic strip, but not catch the wires on fire, and my fingers. And so, I want you to watch here, and I want everybody's attention over here. Everybody's attention over here, but I'm not gonna, it's not going to take very long. If I can get this hot air and get that vitamin tight strip, you should see movement here. Right, don't burn. Tell me if you see it. Oh. 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 Yeah. Oh. 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 Yeah. Don't burn. Let's go. So the vitamin tight strip is the secret here, and it gets uh, one piece of metal lengthens faster than another piece of metal. I'm going to see the dual. This is a dual uh, from the center. Wait, is it dual? All right, here we go. Let's go to uh, let's go to the next part here.
All right, so if everybody, uh, I'm going to ask you to get your calculators out. We're going to do some, uh, a little bit of mathematics here. All right, so let me, uh, let me watch the time here a little bit. I want to show you, I want everybody to stop, everybody stop talking to me. Um, when I put a thermometer, when I put a thermometer in something, and, and I know we have digital thermometers, which takes away from some of the physics that they did. They've been having thermometers for about 400 years. But take a look at this. I showed you this uh, in the first semester. The thermometer has mercury in it. Uh, if it's an expensive thermometer, it's a really accurate one. It probably has mercury in it uh, if it's silver. If it looks like green or purple or red, it's colored alcohol. Okay, so there's no mercury, it's red or anything like that. Yes? In regular thermometers? Uh, I don't know. I just oh, is that right? Um, what are they using? I hear it's titanium. Uh, gallium. Okay, gallium happens to have a um, a melting point, which is um, pretty. I can lay it in my hand; it'll melt. So that's interesting. I, if you uh, find an article on that, I'll give you credit for that because no one's ever told me that before. The whole idea of mercury. Mercury has such bad press. Um, people don't like mercury. Anything. And, but they use mercury thermometers for like 400 years, okay? Uh, if you could find that article, I'd like to read that. Anyway, so here, in the bottom part of the thermometer, the glass is really thin. That's why you don't want to poke. You don't want to poke things with a, a nice mercury thermometer because that glass is meant to be kind of thin. But then, this is thick glass And it has an incredibly small hole here. And I, I think in the first semester I showed you that I had one that had a hair, a really thin hair. I could barely, it took me 10 minutes to get that in that hole. That's how small the hole is there. And so what happens is, here's the theory of a thermometer. The particles that are coming in contact with this glass, if they're moving faster, let me have everybody attention, okay? If the particles out here are moving faster, that means their average kinetic energy is higher, they're gonna hit the glass and make the glass particles move faster. If the glass particles move faster, they're gonna come in contact with the mercury and it's gonna make the mercury particles move faster. Well, so what? Well, the mercury is going to expand. Mercury expands pretty quickly when you heat it. So what's gonna happen there? Uh, where are you gonna go? You're trying to expand, where are you gonna go? They're going to go up that really thin tube right there. Now, as long as the company puts the numbers in the right place, then you have an accurate thermometer. Anyway, that's the theory about how a thermometer works. Uh, <clears throat> now, I'm going to go over here, and we're going to get into some mathematics here, okay? <clears throat> now, so far, we know that temperature and heat are not the same thing at all. Thermal energy... Um, that moves from one place to another is called heat. So sometimes I interchange those two words. I'll say the word heat. Uh, let's take a look here. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's say that both of these uh, waters are at 100 degrees. Let, let's say this is at 100. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, these are not. Okay. What, what if I have this amount of water and this amount of water and I heat this one for 30 seconds with a Bunsen burner, and I heat this for 30 seconds with a Bunsen burner. That means I've delivered the same amount of heat. I'm gonna wait till everybody's ready. <clears throat> I've delivered the same amount of heat to both. So what happens here? Look at the thermometer. It's up there maybe around 90 degrees Celsius. This one here might be around 30 degrees Celsius. What, why is that? I add the same amount of heat to this amount of water and this amount of water. Well, what happens to the temperature? That's uh, not as big as the other 90. Okay, try it again. Aww. <laughs> All right, so I add the same amount of heat, but this one, the thermometer says the water has a higher temperature, doesn't it? Yeah. Which one actually has more heat in it? No, the, 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 same. the same. 
It had to be the same because I, I added the same amount of heat to both. But you, in your mind, I'm trying to get you to conceptualize this. Why would the temperature go up higher here? Because the same amount of heat given to less particles would make them each go faster. But the same amount of heat delivered to a large number of particles would only make them increase their speed by a little bit. So mass has something to do with uh, heat versus temperature, doesn't it? So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to show you a definition. Uh, now, I don't know if you remember the first, um, in the first semester, we talked a lot about um, the, how they made the, the move to the metric system. Remember that? And, and why would the whole world throw away their measurement system and adopt something brand new? It just doesn't make sense because it was simple. Everything they did was simple and it made sense. And, and that's why they wanted to, they, every country in the world, except for us, has gotten rid of whatever they used to use, and they use the SI system. So look at this right here. A long time ago, they said we need to talk about a definition for a certain amount of heat energy, okay? And, and they made it simple. It was called a calorie. Now, I know you've heard the word calorie. And be careful because the calorie in physics is a little bit different than a calorie for foods. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Look at this definition. The calorie in physics is defined is the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of what? Look how simple this was. How much water? Is it some number you'll never remember? No. How much heat it takes to raise the temperature of one gram of water and raise it by how much? One Celsius degree. Now I, I need you to, to pay attention, okay? In physics, that made it so simple. It made it so simple. So what if, <clears throat> what if I had two grams of water and I raised them by one Celsius degree? It would take one calorie if you had one gram of water and raised it by one degree. What if I had two grams of water and, and they both were raised to, by one Celsius degree? That's two calories. What if I had 10 grams of water and they all got raised by one Celsius degree, that's 10 calories. So you know, you know that mass has something to do with this, this equation I'm gonna get into, right? All right, so let's turn the page. And let's talk about this. Uh, a physics calorie though is not a huge amount of energy. It's not a huge amount of energy. So when people were doing the food industry, the food industry, like for example, let's say you invent a new product you want to sell in the supermarket, okay? Uh, like Nathan's hot dogs. At one time they had to do that, right? Oh, yeah. You cannot, you will not have approval to sell that food unless you pay a lot of money to have somebody else test it. And what they will do is they will test it and say, how many calories, if somebody ate that hot dog, how many calories? And I was, when I was younger, like you guys, nobody ever talked about calories. <clears throat> you either ate something or you didn't. You either liked it or you didn't. But even now, if I go to McDonald's, they will post <clears throat> the calories on every item. You see that? They, they, somebody took them to court and said, oh, I didn't know a Big Mac had a lot of calories. Yeah, wake up. Wake up. Are you yeah. kidding me? Oh, I didn't know eating fried chicken uh, five times a week would make me get fat. Yeah, wake up. Here's another one. I, don't I never understood this. When I was your age, there were all kinds of uh, people who were smoking, smoking commercials, smoking advertising magazine. It was a huge, huge business. You get it? And then people go to court and say, oh, I didn't know smoking was hurting my health. Oh, come on. There's no way you didn't know that. I have people say, uh, I drink alcohol. I drink alcohol like five days a week. I didn't know that was going to do something to my liver. There's no way. So anyway, let me tell you what's going on here, okay? In the food industry, then, you have to actually have it tested to see how many calories it does have in there. Now, a food calorie, that's right here, a food calorie, and by the way, um, a, a food calorie is a thousand little physics calories. 
So a physics calorie is small, but a food calorie is a thousand of those. <clears throat> now, so what happens is when you eat something, you eat a certain amount of things in your body, and if your body burns all of that, if all of it comes in there and you use every bit of it to move your arms and stuff like that, you won't gain any weight because you, you took in uh, 1,500 calories, you used 1,500 calories just to be alive or to exercise, whatever. You're not gonna gain weight. But if you take in 4,000 calories a day and you burn 2,000, that, that material that's in your body still contains 2,000 calories of energy stored as, as food. And your body says, well, you didn't use this today. What am I supposed to do with it? And it'll sometimes change it into uh, fat. It'll change it into fat and said, well, I, I guess you want me to, I guess you want me to store this for later in case you don't eat, maybe you don't eat any food tomorrow and you, you'll need that, you know, for your survival. And so your body will, <clears throat> will actually change it into fat. And not only have fat from the outside, but you can have fat inside. You have fat covering your organs and you don't even know it. You wouldn't even know there's fat in there. So that's what they're talking about when they talk about you took in too many calories. So what the stuff you took in there had stored energy in chemical bonds. You stored it. Your body broke down a certain number of them and used it. And anything that was left over, he said, I guess you want me to save it. I'll save it. All right, so let's do, um, let's go over here. And I will tell you this, that this will be the last thing today. Uh, the SI system, I love teaching the calorie because it's so simple. The amount of heat it takes to raise one gram of water, raise it by one Celsius degree. Everybody can remember that. Uh, but the calorie is still used today, but what is the SI unit for any kind of energy? Electrical energy, kinetic energy, potential energy, um, chemical energy. What, what is the energy unit in physics? Anybody know? Joule. Now, it just so happens then that a calorie, it says here a calorie is 4.186 joules, and, and I would give that number to you uh, I'm going to ask you to memorize that, but uh, a calorie is the same as that. So if you did factor label, you say one calorie, this is physics calorie, is 4.186 uh, joules. And so if you had, um, I could do another uh, factor, another uh, conversion factor I do is 4.18 joules uh, is one calorie. So if I wanted to change calories into joules, I'd use this. If I want to take joules into calories, I'd use that one. And you guys know factor label, right? All right, so one more minute. Here we go. A woman with an average diet consumes and expands about 2,000 big C. Now, the food calorie is big C calorie. And the physics calorie is a little C calorie, okay? 2,000 calories per day. The energy used by her body is eventually given off as heat. How many joules per second will her body give off? So let's take a look. Uh, if she's 2,000 big C calories per day, that's my given, right? This is my given. And here it is. Uh, one day is 24 hours. One hour is 3,600 seconds. So now I've got seconds. And then I'm going to change calories into joules. Now, why didn't I use 4.186? Why didn't I use 4? Why did I use 4,186? Because what kind of calorie was that? And that's a thousand regular calories, right? So actually, then that's the number I use for a food calorie. And, and when you get down here, it comes out to be 97 joules per second. Now, I don't have time to do every chapter in physics, but um, what is the SI unit for power? Power is energy per second. What is the SI unit for power? No, I already told you. What is the SI unit for power? I already told you. Watts, okay. Well, anyway, so what happens is a, a joule per second is energy per second, and that's called power. And um, 
you know what you guys use uh, probably in your lifetime more? Uh, horsepower. Your car has a certain amount of horsepower. It can deliver a certain amount of energy per second. All right, tomorrow. Tomorrow, what's up? Um, make sure you have read, make sure you have read this right here. This is the hardest part of the chapter. And if we get this tomorrow, we'll be in good shape, okay? Everything else is pretty easy compared to that.